Good afternoon everybody. My name is Sri Sen. I'm a policy and training associate with JPAL South Asia and will be moderating today's session. Today's roundtable will be on experimental and quasi-experimental evaluation methods and is the fourth in a series of roundtable events that JPAL South Asia has been organizing. Before we start, we'd like to have a round of introductions, please. So if each of you could introduce yourself and the organization that you work for. We can start with you. Yeah, hi, I'm Neha. I'm from NASCOM Foundation. NASCOM Foundation is the CSR arm of NASCOM, which is the IT association of Indian IT BPO member companies. I'm part of the research team there. Hello, everybody. My name is Santosh Kumar Jha, and uh, I am working with Landisa as national manager for research, monitoring, and evaluation. Good afternoon, I'm Anupam Srivastava. I'm a Director for India Programs for DevInfo, which you know is a development uh, monitoring tool. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bindu Madhavi. I'm working with an organization called Breakthrough. Uh, it's a human rights organization which works on violence against women, contributing towards violence against women, and I'm a monitoring and evaluation person. Hi, I'm Lena Sushant. I work for Breakthrough. Hi, I'm Arshad Mirza. I'm a research associate with Small Enterprise Finance Center, and we do research on providing different means of providing finance for the medium and small scale industries. Uh, hi, I'm Akanksha Arora, and I work as a data coordinator at DOM the World. Uh, hi, I'm Sukriti, and I work as a project co coordinator at DOM the World. Uh, I'm Shob, I'm with the Institute of Social Studies Trust. Hi, I'm Amartya. I work with Kriya and I look after the monitoring and evaluation unit in Kriya. Good afternoon. I'm Kavita Sharma, Assistant Professor at Department of Elementary Education, NCERT. So I've also been associated with the um, program evaluation activities that we have conducted with our, in our department. And Hi, I'm Adhamita Gupta. I'm the Chief Economist and the Senior Advisor for the Center of Innovation and Partnership at USAID and currently looking to see how we evaluate activities that are looking at development innovations as the way forward. Hi, I'm Lan, um, and I'm with USAID also, and I'm the monitoring and evaluation person. Hi, I'm Francis Ratnam. I'm a senior fellow with ICRIA. Hi, everybody. I'm Rohit Kumar Palai, a research officer from Room to Read. Hi, um, my name is Dilesh Vargis. I am from Room to Read, India. Uh, hi, all. I'm Neha Nagpal, and I'm working as monitoring and evaluation officer for Reading Room program in Room to Read, India, and it basically runs libraries in government schools. Satoko Okamoto, visiting scientist, Institute of Rural Research and Development. We are an NGO based in Gurgaon. policy analyst for a USAID program, multi-donor program uh, on agriculture value chain development. Uh, and in my spare time, I'm uh, facilitating the development of uh, uh, a group known as the Community of Evaluators for South Asia. And uh, uh, I'm a member of the strategic advisory team for the community. And later on, I will be telling you a little bit more about uh, our community and inviting all of you to come mm -hmm. and join us. I'm Mojit Kapoor. I'm an assistant professor at the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, and I don't have a mic. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm just kidding. Hi, I'm Sharon Barnhart. I'm an assistant professor at IFMR Chennai and a faculty affiliate at JPAL. Uh, my name is John Floretta, and I'm the deputy director at JPAL South Asia and Clear South Asia. Um, if the people at the back could introduce themselves as well, please. I work with Center for Policy Research. Uh, Siddharth Pillay from Sesame Workshop, India. Uh, Diva Dhar uh, from JPAL, South Asia. 
Anand Sudarshan, I am a postdoc at Harvard and a senior research manager at JPAL. I'm Stuti. I'm working with the International Water Management Institute. It's a research organization that's part of the consultative group on international agricultural research. Hi, I'm Kumar. I'm currently working as a research uh, associate at International Initiative for Impact Evaluation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Chandra Mallika Biswas uh, from Indian Institute of Dalit Studies. I work as an associate fellow there. Uh, I'm Dr. Vinod Mishra. I also work in the Indian Institute of Dalit Studies as associate fellow. Thank you. Thank I you. Sorry. Sorry. I'm Mitesh Thakkar. I'm from Field Data. We provide mobile technology services for data collection and evaluation. Nikhil, I work with the JPAL policy team. Bastien Michel, I'm a research manager for JPAL South Asia. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, before the speakers start with their presentations, I'd just like to explain the format of the roundtable. So each panelist will have a presentation which will last for about 30 minutes. And then there will be a 20-minute long question-answer session. Um, we will take two or three questions at a time before we let the panelists um, respond to them. The other thing is that everyone has been given a registration form and a feedback form. So if towards the end of the session, they can fill that up and hand it over to either Priya or Rashmi. Thank you. Uh, I would like to now call upon John Floretta, the Deputy Director of JPAL South Asia. And um, he will give the opening remarks and an overview of impact evaluation. Welcome, John. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I th thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, as I said, as Shree said, my name is John. And so this is our fourth clear roundtable. The first one we did was on uh, technology for data collection in the health field. The second was looking at theory of change. And the third was focusing on quantitative instruments, so how you design them and how you would go pilot them in the field. And here today, we're, gonna, we're switching a little bit over in, into methods and specifically into impact evaluation. So we're very, very fortunate uh, to have two esteemed professors. Uh, so Sharon Barnhart is here from IFMR. And she's going to speak on randomized control trials, uh, experiment, basically uh, randomized experiments, experiment approach to, to doing uh, uh, impact evaluation. And Mudit Kapoor is going to talk a little bit about a quasi-experimental technique known as differences in difference. So what I want to do is, in my presentation is just kind of set the stage for, for our two professors to provide some kind of background into experimental approaches and quasi-experimental approaches for doing evaluation and the, the role of them. So I'm going to start with an overview to impact evaluation and then talk a little bit about uh, randomized experiments and a little bit about differences in difference. Now, first, I, I think it's helpful to, to consider like, the, role, the broader role of impact evaluation within broader program evaluation. Specifically, there's, there's lots of different types of program evaluation that we could do. So when we're before we're doing a program and we're trying to understand you know, the opportunities or the needs in a specific community, there's a kind of thing we do that is needs assessment, trying to get a better understanding, maybe through qualitative or quantitative methods, uh, of what the needs of a particular population are. Now, <clears throat> a, a whole range of program evaluation is on program theory assessment. So this can be done before a program or it can be done after a program. But basically, it's a look at how do your, your inputs, whether they be human inputs or financial inputs, technical inputs, how are they supposed to be translating into the changes that you want to see? And this is often, this is what we discussed in our second workshop on theory of change. And a good program theory assessment is kind of the blueprint for either process evaluations or impact evaluations. Now, <clears throat> process evaluation is a, a very general term. 
Uh, but here we're kind of looking at, okay, did the program, given its, what it stated its plan was for implementation, did it follow through as planned? And here kind of in general, in your uh, theory of change, you're looking at did the activities play, take place, did the outputs take place? And so a lot of program evaluation focuses on, on these two parts. When it gets into looking at outcomes or changes in behavior or knowledge and attitude, a lot of program evaluation will, will, will do that, um, but trying to like, so, see how the program contributed to those changes. And what really changes in, in impact evaluation, how I'm going to define it here, is you're trying to go beyond contribution to changes and try to isolate you know, the at, to attribute those changes to your particular program. And there's a variety of different ways that, that we can do this, and we're going to talk about two of those ways here. So in a process evaluation, or many typical program evaluations, we're, at, we're kind of describing what happened. The, the mind change that we're, when in an impact evaluation is to describe what changes happened compared to what would have happened in the absence of the program. So you're trying to get at like, what was the actual effect that can be attributed to your program. And the, thinking about what the broader value of this is, um, it's, you know, <clears throat> a big problem that we have in development is, is that not, we don't have too few answers, or too, we don't have too few options for what we could do. So if we're looking at ways to raise school participation, we could essentially, there's a whole range of programs we could choose from. So we could perhaps build more schools. Uh, we could set up a conditional cash transfer program to families that families will get, will get transfers of cash conditional on sending their children to school. You could give girls bicycles or give them free uniforms. Uh, there's lots of possible different en interventions you can do. And the role of impact evaluation is to try to figure out what the results can be attributed to your program and to try to give us a sense of what programs we should be investing further in, investing in programs that work. Um, so how can we do more with a given budget based upon evidence of effectiveness? And we, at j we believe that if people, if governments, if international organizations, if foundations, had greater confidence that the, the programs are turning into results, then you actually could increase the size of pie that's going towards development interventions. And in, you know, there's, instead of asking kind of does international development or does aid or does uh, poor pro poverty programs work, we want to shift that question to which programs work best, why and when, and then how can we scale up which programs work. So, Let's go back a little bit to how we're choosing here to measure, to define impact. So when I first started studying uh, evaluation, the impact was defined to me is that you have a particular program, say a four-year intervention uh, on remedial education, and you'd measure the impact by showing up three years after the program finished and see what kind of changes are, are still there. Or another you know, idea of, of how you could measure impact would be that you ask community members to, to state like, the most significant changes that, that they saw or, that, from the program. How we're defining impact here is a little bit more narrow. Okay? So what we're, we're going to try to do is try to get a sense of what were the results in the program and pair those results to what would have happened if there wasn't a program. Okay? So this is a term we use called the counterfactual. So, the counterfactual represents the state of the world that program participants would have experienced in the absence of a program. Now, the tricky part is, is like the counterfactual can't be observed. So, this example. So, let's try to figure out what, if we're interested in uh, my income or my happiness, you know, what would be, how would that change if I went and got a degree at, a master's degree at IFMR? Now, I, there's only one me, okay? So if I do go get the master's degree at IFMR, there's nothing to compare my future wages against because you can't compare it to the John that didn't go and do that degree. So that's, that's the tricky part, is that in real life, you don't observe the counterfactual. Now, 
So what we're going to be talking about are different ways that we can mimic a counterfactual or reconstruct a counterfactual. So we're broadly going to be talking about two specific ways. Uh, one is an example of an experimental approach or a randomized approach. And the other is uh, a quasi-experimental or non-randomized approach. So here it's going to be a, a randomized evaluation, uh, an RCT that Sharon's going to discuss. And Mood is going to discuss, coming from a natural experience, a uh, difference in differences approach. So what I'm going to try to do is, is just set this up. And Anushua, how much more time do I have? Just so I'm... Okay. So let's take a look at what, what, in this definition, what is impact. So let's say we have a, a program that's looking to increase uh, student learning. And say within a particular school, this is the trend of how students say based upon test scores. But what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a program where we provide additional tutoring for students who have fallen behind. And that's our intervention. Okay? Now, what we want to do is look at kind of maybe get a sense of the test scores to see how our program improved learning. And so commonly what we would do is maybe you know one technique for looking at test scores is to say that where people were at the beginning of the program. This is where they were at the end of the program. And the result of our program is probably the result of our program is probably somewhere in here. Okay, we and somehow we think that we contributed to to learning. But the question is how do you know how much you how much you can how much you contributed? And to do that, we kind of have to construct what would have been levels of those children if we wouldn't have done the program. And that's what impact evaluation from this definition is all about. And you attribute that, the changes compared to what would have happened as your program impact. So it's not always so simple. You, you, you don't always know uh, what, that, what would have happened in the absence of the program. So here, at, at first blush, this would look like a highly effective program. The trend goes, uh, it's much steeper in terms of learning levels. But perhaps what would have happened if you didn't have the program would have even been increased learning levels. So what example of that, you could imagine if it was something like you were changing the way schools were run, and a school was on a very, very good trajectory, uh, things were just starting to click and come together. It could have shot up learning levels. And then you went back and you maybe changed the relationship between the headmaster and the student, or you increase monitoring that the teachers thought was over burdensome. You changed around the school hour. Something that actually had a, a negative impact, but you wouldn't know that it had a negative impact unless you had something to compare it against. You can think of another example. And in this example, at first blush, it looks like your intervention had a very negative consequence. Okay, because things seem to be on this trajectory. And then after your program, they drop down here. And you can maybe imagine a situation um, where, in fact, what would have happened in the absence of the program is the results would have been much worse. So say this was like an uh, uh, improved seeds program. And you're giving far farmers improved seeds, uh, expecting it to lead to increases in yield. And actually, somewhere around here, right when you started your program, there was a drought. Okay? So in the absence of these improved seeds, the results might have been much, much worse and your program actually helped them be in a better situation than they otherwise would have been. It had a positive impact, but that's not something you can get a sense of unless you're trying to mimic the counterfactual in some way. So <clears throat> randomized experience is what Sharon's going to give us one example. They're also known as RCTs, randomized field trials. And there's several different quasi or non-experimental approaches. Mudit's going to talk about one of them. The, difference in differences. And I'm just going to try to set that up first uh, by focusing on a specific program and kind of walking you through these different evaluation methodologies. So here, we're, we'll refer to a program that Pratham ran uh, called the Balsaki program. I'm told in Hindi, Balsaki means something like teacher, student, child's friend or child's helper. Is that right? Something like that. Um, so what the, basically what the program was, uh, Pratham started running it in, and it was a remedial education program focusing on 
students in the classroom who had fallen behind. And what, to give them additional, uh, a chance at catching up in their, in their, uh, in their courses, the, the, they would, the students would, the teachers would pick half the students, form them in as a group, students who have fallen behind, form them as a, as a group, and they would hire uh, a woman from the community with a secondary education to spend half the school day uh, giving them uh, training or give, teaching them, but teaching them at their level, not the level that they'd already fallen behind. And the woman would be paid 10 or $15 for this a month on average in US prices. Now, what we want to do is try to get a sense of what's the impact of this program. So what we'll do is we're going to look at two non-experimental approaches, so pre-post and ex-post. We're going to look a little bit at a difference in differences setup, and then we'll look at an experimental setup. OK, so the first non-experimental uh, approach is, is called pre-post. And this is actually very, very common. So often you would take a, you have a baseline at the beginning of your program. You'd have an end line at the end, at, at the end. And you would basically look at, say, in this case, test scores. Um, now, if, so if, let's just say, at the beginning of the program, the average test score was around 25. Afterwards, say, six months later, the score jumps up to 50. And my question is to you, under what conditions would 26.42, under what conditions could we interpret that as the impact of the Valsafi program? So what like, big assumption would you have to make if this was, this was the impact of the program? And remind you, the impact is what would have happened, comparing the results to what would have happened in the absence of the program. So if we're going to say that this program leads to a 26.42 increase in test scores, what's that key assumption? I mean, it's a question. So what's that key assumption that we're making? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So basically, we're assuming that during these six months, that children wouldn't have been learning, that the post-test score would have been the same. Now, that's, that's probably not a great assumption, right? Um, and here. This is your assumption, essentially. There would have been no learning. And you're attributing this change specifically to your program. So, so here, I mean, this is uh, Madhumita asking to talk a little bit about attribution versus contribution. And, and what USAID's thinking about now is looking at uh, what they call performance evaluations and com comparing it to potential impact evaluations. And so here, you could, you could probably say that your program is you, know, you could try to make the case that you're contributing to some learning, but the actual results of it, how much you're contributing, you, you don't know from this type of evaluation. That's just the weakness of doing a baseline and end line is that fundamental assumption that at the end, that the, in this case, the student's test scores would be the same at the end line as they were at the baseline. Now, and sometimes that, that assumption may not be too big. So if I was maybe to look at uh, your learning levels about randomized control trials. Uh, and we did a pre-test at the beginning, uh, today. And at the end of the, of the, of the lecture today, we did a post-test. And we saw that there was an increase. Now, now here, it's probably fair to say that it was this lecture that led to that increase, because there probably weren't outside forces in this last couple of hours that were contributing to that increase. Whereas here, it may be what was really driving this increase had nothing to do with the program, but it had Thing to do with, say, other children's natural learning anyway. They would have stayed at that learning. Or maybe there was a new government program in those areas that was really driving that, taking place, so it was really driving those changes and not our program. OK, so fine. Now let's, let's try a, a different way of trying to measure what the outcome of the program is. And let's compare test scores of children who were in classes that had the, the Balsaki teacher with test scores from children who, who didn't have the Balsaki teacher. Now, so here, we, as we saw before, the final test score is 51.22 of those who did have. And those who didn't have the extra tutor, it was 56.47. So under this way of looking at the program, we actually see a decrease of negative, uh, negative five points. Now, 
my question is, if this is a valid uh, measurement, what assumption are we making about <clears throat> these two groups of students, those who got the Balsaki and those who didn't get the Balsaki? In the back? Yeah. 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 So that's the fundamental assumption here is that the, the children who had the Balsaki tutor and the children who don't were on average kind of the same. Okay? They had the same rates of learning, they had the same basic learning. And so here for a negative difference, what would probably be the reason behind that from what I've told you about the program, what would probably be the reason why you see a negative difference here? Can you turn your mic on? So I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. It would be because uh, the children who are getting the um, Balsaki program are basically the weaker in studies uh, children. Like the children who are already good in their studies are not getting the Balsaki uh, program. So this particular score means that the children who are actually weak have been brought up to the level of the uh, what the class should be. So yeah. this is a positive indicator, not a negative indicator, even though the difference is in negative and not positive. Yeah, that, and that definitely, thank you. That definitely could be the case. So we basically said that the weaker students are going to get the Balsaki. So from the very beginning, we know that these students are probably starting at a lower level. So what could have actually happened that in the absence of the Balsaki, the difference would have been even bigger. Okay? But they've, maybe this has narrowed the difference somewhat. But again, it's, if we're trying to measure and, and attribute our program, this probably doesn't seem like the best way to do it because you need to make that fundamental assumption that these two groups are the same. So let's think. Now, let me try to give a very simple introduction to, to lay the groundwork for Moodit on, on difference and differences. It's basically, here, instead of comparing the, in the, pre, in the ex post, we compared the final test scores from the groups who got the Balsaki and who didn't against each other. Now, we're going to actually compare the gains in, tech sc in test scores. So how much did the students who got the Balsaki improve between the pre and the post test? Compare w with how much did those who didn't get the Balsaki improve? So basically, you're taking these two methods and you're almost putting them together, right? So in the first case, the big problem was, was that we were looking at any changes. So in the pre-post, we were looking at any changes in test scores before and after, and we were attributing that cause to, to our program. We didn't have anything to compare it against. And here what you're basically doing is you're still looking at the test scores from those who got the Balsaki before and after, but you're, gonna, you're also going to compare that against the gain in test scores from children who didn't get the Balsaki before and after. Essentially, you're saying that, that the children who didn't get the ball, the children who didn't got to get the Balsaki is what would have happened, that rate of learning is what would have happened for the children who did. So let me just try to make this, show this in a graph. So basically, you, you, the first difference we did was <coughs> for children who got the Balsaki, they improved by 26.42. Now, children who got the Balsaki, they improved by 19.60. So they're here. Now what you're doing is essentially comparing these two different rates against each other and attributing the difference to your program here. And so here, the difference between the, the increase of test scores for those who got the Balsaki and who didn't get the Balsaki is 6.82. Now, here, you're also, you're also making, so this is good because we're bringing in the time period from the pre-post, and we also have a, a comparison group. Now, the, 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 the fundamental assumption here is that these two groups are going to be learning at the same rate. And so let's, let's just try to unpack this a little bit more. So can someone tell me a reason why maybe the students who got the Balsaki would learn at a slower rate from students who did get the Balsaki? What, what could be a, a reason why they would learn at, potentially learn at a slower rate? OK. And what about the, at the, the, the characteristics of the groups themselves? 
So you, what you could argue is that because these are the better off students, that they're going to be, they have the capacity to learn at a faster rate. Okay, so maybe using them as your counterfactual for the students who did get the Balsaki isn't appropriate. But you could also flip it on its head. And you could also learn, argue that the students who did get the Balsaki would learn as a faster rate. And the reason maybe you could argue that is because no one, the le lectures have always been over their heads. And now that they have someone teaching them at the right level, they have so much room to make up that they actually would learn at a faster rate. So here, the, it's a, this is a better, oh, I'll come back to you in a second. It's, it's a, this is a, probably a better uh, approximation of, of a counterfactual than the first two, but it's still based on these assumptions that, they, that the two groups learn, the two groups would learn at the same rate, because still these two groups are fundamentally different from each other. Sir? So, but clearly there is another factor at work, because you know, uh, if uh, the average score for children without a Balsaki, they should have remained static, you know. Uh, because there is clearly another factor at work, which is helping uh, in the improvement of scores for the other groups. Yeah, well. yeah. It, 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 let's just say that this is a six-month period. That we could just say that the nat that children are going to naturally learn anyway. Okay, they're going to naturally learn in their classrooms anyway. I mean, but the difference in learning, I mean, the difference in the scores is so stark that you know, and that is the problem I would have brought up. You know, sometimes there are multiple factors at play, and you don't know which factor to attribute when it comes to your program achievement? Yeah, so I, I think this, this gets you a little bit closer of being able to attribute, but it still relies on, on some assumptions, which, which in some cases you could maybe argue that similar trends of, of increases are, are, is an is assumption that you can make. And in other circumstances, you could argue that it's not. So it still relies on, on some basic assumptions. Yes. So let me kind of fast forward to the randomized. And how, Anusha, how much time do I have now? Let me just try to give you a, a, a preview of a, a randomized evaluation. Um, so imagine, now, <clears throat> so essentially in a randomized evaluation, we, you hear these treatment groups and control groups. And all that means is the groups who got the program and the groups who, who didn't get the program. And uh, let me also try to demystify what, uh, what a randomized evaluation or an RCT is, is about. Basically, it's, it's two essential things. You pick a large enough sample size. In this case, let's say a large enough group of schools. And then within that group of schools, before the program begins, you randomly assign which schools will get the Balsaki and which schools don't. And so those two things together, the big enough sample size and the random assignment, means that before the project, on average, those two sets of schools are the same. So any difference in learning outcomes after the program you can attribute to your program. So let me try to walk you, walk you through this. So how this could look is, let's say that these are several of the schools across uh, a couple of districts. And there are too many total to work in, so we're going to random, so here we're going to randomly sample, which is different than random assignment. We're going to randomly sample some of the schools. Okay? And next, we're going to randomly assign, like maybe through a lottery, which schools will get the Balsaki program and which schools won't. So in this case, the ones who get the program would be the red, the, the treatment group, and the ones, the schools that don't get it would be the blue, the control group. Now, at the end, okay, we would look at kind of average test scores at the program, the schools who got the program, and compare them against average test scores of who didn't. And it's this, this fundamental assumption that because our sample size was large enough, that the, sc the schools, the sets of schools on average were the same before the program. So what do I mean by the same? You maybe have like the, the average income. There'd be no statistically significant difference in, say, the average income uh, of the households of, of the children. Uh, you have the same number of motivated teachers and the same number of lazy teachers. Uh, you would have like the same kind of government programs would affect on average between these two sets of school, uh, edu education programs would be similar. Okay? And then any changes that you had throughout the program, so any changes of, say, government policy, or any changes from, let's say, schools getting shut due to some natural disaster, those should also equally affect the two sets as well. So at the end of the program, you can attribute the change to your program itself. So how you would conduct a randomized experiment would be 
you design carefully, you randomly assign, in this case, which schools would, be, would get the program and which ones would not. First, did you want to make sure that the randomization worked? You want to do a test. And Sharon, in her presentation, will show you this kind of uh, proxy, this, this, this type of uh, test on group means. So you'd really want to look like, through a baseline. At, you know, does it, in fact, look like the average income between the two schools is the same? Or do, is it, in fact, the case that, say, uh, they both have the kind of average number of teachers across schools? You can actually check beforehand that these two sets uh, are the same. Um, you want to monitor that the, the schools who shouldn't get the program uh, don't later on get the Balsaki program. And then basically you collect follow-up data. So in this case, you do the testing, and then you make the comparison against the two groups of schools. Um, now, again, the key advantage is, is that because the members of the group, or these two groups, there's no systematic differences between the schools who got the program and the schools who don't. So at the end, you can attribute any change between the two to the program itself. And so here you've got the average uh, effect of the, of the program that was as estimated. This is using real data. was estimated at 5.8. So in conclusion, I, I just want to leave, stop with three key points. First is that you know, when we're looking at like how evaluation can connect with policy, uh, there's still plenty of room for process evaluation and, and, and evaluation using qualitative means and methods. One important contribution of impact evaluation is that it's going to help you get a sense, factoring in other factors, of what the result of your program was. Okay? And when we know and we can compare, say, the Balsaki program for remedial education against the results of perhaps paying teachers extra money, so performance-based pay for teachers, or results maybe for giving teachers greater job security. Or the, so you could have several different interventions, but we should be basing policies as a country and as organizations based upon evidence of what works, and impact evaluation can be one step towards that. Second is that not, you know, there's different impact evaluation methods experimental and non-experimental, experimental and quasi-experimental, are based on fundamentally different assumptions. And what I don't mean to say is that kind of randomized evaluation uh, is the best, and there's no place for other types of quasi-experimental methods. What, what Moodit is going to show in, when he presents is he's going to talk about, uh, he's going to talk about a difference and difference approach, and he's going to talk about a macro kind of policy, a, a, a change of policy across the state of India, was it? So here's a, it was a change in basically uh, how much subsidized credit different size firms can get. And in the case of, you only have one India. So in the case of like a big, a randomized evaluation is completely untenable because you can't, you wouldn't be able to randomize necessarily this policy for different parts of the country. Maybe you could, but it would be extremely difficult. Another advantage of a difference in differences approach is that you, you, know, you can actually look back after the fact. Um, you can, you're a little bit more flexible. So the, the, what hamstrings you a little bit in a randomized evaluation is the need usually to, do, to start the evaluation before the program and to, and to do that random assignment. And difference in difference because it gives you a little bit more flexibility. And there's many, many cases as well where you can offer, argue that this parallel trends assumption holds. That the, the, the trends between the groups who got the program and who didn't would in fact be the same, which means it's a completely valid method. Uh, randomized evaluation uh, works very, very well when you can start the evaluation before the program. It works a lot better for smaller uh, more micro interventions. You, it'd be very difficult to kind of do, you can, but it'd be very difficult to do randomized evaluation of, say, like hydroelectricity programs or road building. Um, so they can give you very, very precise answers, but also for answering, to be frank, somewhat smaller questions. So the purpose of my lecture was to, to try to give you uh, a basic overview of impact evaluation, of randomized evaluation, and of difference in difference. And now I'll, I'll step away and I'll turn the mic over to Sharon, or she can introduce her. 
Um, so how we'll do is Sharon will, will, will speak on one of her studies uh, that she did uh, uh, looking at, so in this case, and she'll get to get into the details of it, it was a kind of a naturalist experiment. So I'll let Sharon explain the details, but it was essentially uh, the government uh, decided to make a certain program available uh, to people, but it did so on the basis of a lottery. And that lottery is kind of the same as you would see in a, a randomized control trial, where you would basically be uh, randomly assigning which, who would be available for the program, who would qualify the program, and who wouldn't. Uh, and so how we'll set up, she'll give her a chance to present her paper, and then we'll have 20 minutes of Q&A. Mudit will then present his paper for half an hour, and have 20 minutes of Q&A. And we'll end with a larger 20-minute Q&A session on, on impact evaluation. Thank you, John. It gives me great pleasure. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sharon Barnhart, who is an assistant professor at the Institute for Financial Management and Research in Chennai, where she teaches development economics and serves as the research director of the Center for Microfinance as well. She is also a faculty affiliate with j South Asia and an affiliate of the Institute for the Study of Labor. Her primary research interests lie in urban housing and sanitation, health, and inter-ethnic cooperation. Sharon received an MPA from Princeton University and a PhD in public policy from Harvard University. Welcome, Sharon. Uh, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in the, the roundtable today. Some of your faces look very familiar. I'm sure I've seen you in executive education uh, courses that, that, that JPL's done on, on RCTs. Um, so uh, uh, the work that I'm presenting today is, uh, as John mentioned, in studying a, a housing program. And this is work done with uh, two co-authors, Eric and Rohini Pandey. Um, so I'm going to present it almost the same way I, I would if my goal were to, you know, to showcase the results of the paper. But I'm going to be uh, more specific, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, more detailed about why we're doing what we're doing it, uh, along each, each step in, in the process. So I'll actually start with the motivation for the study, uh, tell you a little bit about the housing program in Ahmedabad, uh, do a lot more on the, the methodology, and get through as much of the results as we can in, in the, the time that we have. Okay. So really the motivation for doing any kind of study uh, in, in this area is the large number of people. We start with a large number of people who are living in slums. In this. So there's something like 43 percent of the urban population in the developing world lives in overcrowded conditions without proper uh, sewage, sanitation, and, you know, kind of permanent housing materials. And this number is expected just to increase. As, as urbanization increases, uh, by 2030, we think the population of the world will be 8 billion people, and 2 billion people will be living in slums. Okay, so it's a huge number of people. Um, and when you think about, you know, specifically how, where, where slums are in South Asia, uh, we have a situation where we have large populations who have unmet demand for these significant for these goods, right? So, uh, lots of people who want sanitation and sewage and water, and that goes unmet. They don't have access to these things, and at the same time, they're central located, so they're occupying prime real estate. Right? So, the natural kind of policy, one of the natural policy solutions that came out of this was to say, okay, let's move people to the periphery of the city where the more give them better housing. So there's a, we're changing this distance, increasing the distance, setting them higher quality housing. Okay? And so the problem with this is that you know we probably haven't fully thought through, and anecdotes have suggest that we haven't fully thought through, or they haven't fully thought through what actually is the impact of distance. You know, of relocating on the periphery. And there are other studies in the work of uh, Professor Mudit that is talking about has has found that there are significant costs. For increasing distance uh, for, for low-income households from their original locations, right? So if you're commuting, you're increasing commuting costs to work, you're in increasing the cost of maintaining your social networks, your caste-based networks, as such as that. And we have, um, you know, so good reason to believe that it doesn't just have an impact on income and um, 
kids' education, access to health, things like that, but that it will also have an impact on their social networks, right? That it will actually change who, the, who they interact with. And there's quite a bit of uh, evidence now that even very small changes in distance have an impact on who people talk to. Right? So we're looking, that's basically to say that we're looking at income, education, those kind of employment and livelihood outcomes, but we're also looking at some kind of social network outcomes in, in this study. And so what we want to do is to identify the impact of this relocation to the periphery on these different kinds of outcomes. And the reason we're looking for an experimental analysis, why we want to uh, have a situation where we have something like a lottery, is that we can't compare people who live, who've made this choice on their own to live in a distant location from those who live in a central location. Right? So you could imagine, you know, I want to know what, you know, what's the impact of living on the urban periphery. Let me just go find some people who live on the urban periphery and compare them to people who live in the city. You know? And we can't just do that because it actually could be that those unobserved and unmeasured characteristics of those individuals that cause them to move to the urban periphery could actually be the cause of a change in income or a change in other things that we see. Right? So we want to be sure that we're attributing uh, any change that we measure to the distance, right? to relocating it to, to, to the periphery, not to personal characteristics of people that cause them to move to the periphery. Right? So we don't, want it, we don't want it to be that we think we're attributing some, the causality to, or an imp we're attributing something to distance, and really we're attributing it to something like, you know, these are people who like the urban periphery because it kind of seems like a village. And so they actually were, are ha more happy in a rural setting, and perhaps those people uh, have a different uh, outlook on how much they work or how much income they want to earn, uh, things like that. Okay, so there are these unmeasured and unobserved characteristics. And that's, it. that's why we're looking for some kind of exogenous variation in, in the locations. Okay? So we're going to use this housing lottery, um, which beneficiaries were randomly chosen. And we'll do that to construct the comparison groups. So the program that we're studying um, was a housing lottery that was connect, uh, conducted in Ahmedabad in Gujarat. Right? So this was uh, actually was, it was a, a program that involved the government, but basically it was led by Seva Union, right? so the Self-Employed Women's Association Union. And so this was uh, women who were beady rollers, and they were part of the, the union and living in shawls. And so basically, Sewa worked with the Ahmedabad Urban Development Association, sorry, authority, uh, to build this col housing colony of 110 houses. And it's typical uh, you know, plan of its day where those houses were located on the far side of the airport, far away from the, the old city where people were living. Um, so Sewa started by making a list of eligible women for the program. So they went around, talked to other BD workers, uh, figured out what their income was, and then basically said, okay, these are the 497, about 500 poorest people in the Beanie Union. Um, so these are the people who will be eligible for the, for the lottery. Okay? And then they actually held a public drawing where they determined who would get the house and who, and who wouldn't. Okay? So you'll have to uh, forgive my, uh, my graphic skills, but I just wanted to reiterate and, and clarify a point of, of how this worked. So they started with this uh, group of workers that are, they determined were eligible based on the income criteria. And then they held a lottery. Right? So this bucket looks like they threw water on the people. <laughs> but this, there's actually no water involved. right? So in the bucket, they had everybody's name. And then uh, the, I think the second in command of Seva at that time drew 110 names out of the bucket. And if your name came out of the bucket, that means you got a house. And if you didn't, uh, that means that you would be you know, eligible for future lotteries or, or, or something like that. But you weren't going to get a house in this new colony. Right? So this lottery determined winners and non-winners. And this is the variation that we uh, exploit in the paper. Right? So uh, everything that we're going to do actually becomes very simple. We're comparing uh, people who won the lottery with people who didn't win the lottery. Okay? And so just for the purposes of clarification, I, want, I, I do want to clarify that even within this group of winners, because it's a voluntary program, uh, most of the people moved into the house, 
most of it means about like 67 percent, two thirds, moved into the house. But some people didn't actually move into the house. They took possession of it. They took the mortgage, but they didn't never actually relo relocated. Okay, so that means that we're still making this comparison because this is what's exogenously determined. Yeah. This is this is the variation that we're exploiting. Mm -hmm. And so that means that this is called an intent to treat effect. And so I think I think John mentioned something about treatment untreated. This is in, this is intent to treat th that kind of analysis. Okay. So if you're looking at uh, or it, you're studying other, or you doing other RCTs, you'll often hear of something called an encouragement design, a randomized encouragement design. This is kind of like that, where they're uh, essentially highly encouraged to to move because there's a subsidy. Okay. Um, so the value of the house was about twenty-four thousand eight hundred rupees at that time. This is just construction costs. There's no imputed cost to the land. They didn't have to pay anything for the land. Um, the houses that they built were like a pretty average size for the time, uh, but somewhat higher quality, right? So they had, you know, the Paka housing with piped water, a private toilet, and a separate kitchen. So at that time, it was definitely higher quality than where these people were living. They were given an allocation letter rather than a full mortgage. You know, so this means that there's, uh, there's definitely some property right created, but it's not the fullest, strongest property right that it could be as if they were given a full title that's registered with the government. So. Uh, the plan is that after everybody repays the mortgage, then they'll all get the titles at the same time. Okay. So they, uh, uh, Sewa arranged the mortgage along with HUDCO. The money came from HUDCO and uh, is, the loan is administered by Sewa. So basically the households had to put down a 900 rupee deposit and they could repay in monthly installments of 124 rupees a month over 20 years. Right. So in all... Um, uh, it'll sum to about 29,760 rupees that they'll pay back. And actually what's interesting here is that they were paying on average then rent of 298 rupees a month, right? So the mortgage payment was less than half of what they, would, that what they were paying on rent. So they get this asset, they get a property right, they get a subsidy, and the monthly payment is, act is lower. So there's something of a potential income, uh, income subsidy as well. So the first thing that we had to do was try to um, rebuild the list of winners. So this is where I, I should uh, clarify that what we're doing is slightly different than, uh, you know, kind of a classic RCT, a classic uh, randomized controlled trial. You'll s the the evaluators will start with the programmers, with the implementers at the beginning, right? And so as John mentioned, do a baseline and do the randomization about the same time. Then the, the program happens for a year or whatever, and then you do an end line, right? So in this case, we found out about this uh, like about 13 or 14 years after the randomization happened, right? So we don't have means we don't have a baseline survey. We have the end line survey that we conducted ourselves. So we, we know that the lottery happened, um, and say what kept the list of the people who won the lottery, right? So that's one one uh, source of the names of the people who were in this in this lottery. But they didn't keep the list of 497 names, right? So we know 110 from them. We know that there were 297 who signed up to participate in another lottery, right? So you could only be in that lottery if you were in the first one. And so there are 297 names that came from that. Uh, one of the, the people who was working for the union at the time was going around to the BD workers and getting their income information, kept in her house the list of... Um, you know, the, 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 her, her part of the, the list, right? So 15 years later, she still has this, you know, her, her work from 1987 in her house, stuck in a drawer somewhere. So we have that. Unfortunately, they didn't, they're not all pack rats. Uh, so it was just the one participant kind of subset list that we could get from that one person. Uh, so there were 109 people on that. It only added 26 actual new names. The other names were still on the other list. And then we went around when we were doing our, our uh, tracking survey to see how many people we could find. And we um, asked people, do you know anybody who was in this housing program? Do you know anybody who participated? And so essentially we, got, we had referrals. You know, so people gave us, gave us names. So this means that through this process, out of 497 names, we were able to actually name 463 people. And when we went back to do the end line survey, we were able to find and survey 463 of those those households. Okay, so uh, it works out to be about 96% of the named and 80, 89% of the 497 participants. Okay. 
And so if people had moved outside of Ahmedabad, we went and we uh, interviewed them wherever they were living. So this means a couple of people uh, outside Mumbai, one person in Hyderabad, and one person in Chennai, I think. Okay? So we followed them up wherever they were so that we would uh, you know, not introduce a bias into our sample because we're missing out on those people who were more mobile than the others. So the actual survey that we conducted in 2007 asked them to give us 20 years' worth of information on their housing. So like, where did you live and what was the condition of the housing and you know, if you paid rent or you owned. We also collected 20 years' worth of employment details. So uh, what does your husband do now? How much money does he make? Where does he make? Does he commute? How much does he pay to commute? And we did that back for 20 years um, for both the BD worker and her husband. And then we also asked questions, a lot of questions about the kids, right? So we asked about the children's education completement, the child, everybody's health, uh, and the children's marriage outcomes, right? Because in an arranged marriage situation, you might find that actually having a house, when you're introduced, being introduced, uh, making introductions, uh, that actually having a house, having this asset, is a good signal to another party that, that you're a stable family. Um, we also looked at some current neighborhood characteristics, and we took GPS coordinates of all of the uh, the residences from 1987 and from 2007. So a lot of the time what you'll see when I do get to the results is that we uh, create uh, a lot of, uh, quite often we're looking at indices. So we're combining multiple indicators into a single measurement. And one of the one reasons we want to do this is because uh, we have actually a lot of outcomes that we're testing in this paper. And it could just be by random chance when you have a lot of outcomes that some are some you notice a significant difference in some just because of because of chance rather than uh, what's really going on. And then the last thing that we did uh, last year is we went back to get some structured interviews with a very small sample. So most of this is quantitative analysis, but then we did follow up and get some qualitative analysis to see if uh, you know when we ask people about their experiences, does it actually kind of similar to what we have in the quantitative results? So normally when you're looking at an RCT paper, table number one is a balance check, right? So, or a randomization check. So this whole methodology of, of using the lottery, using some kind of uh, lottery or random, randomized assignment, is that you're, you're creating groups that are the same on average, right? So there are lots of differences in those, between those individuals within the groups, but you have larger groups and they should be the same on average, right? And so really that's the assumption with the RCT, is that this randomization worked. And so we can't, we can check that it worked on observable characteristics, on data that we do have, and that gives us some comfort that it's also uh, the same on average across groups on those unobservable things that we can't see, like, or can't measure, like motivation or, or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah so if you had a, a classic RCT, a base, the, the baseline survey would provide data for that. Um, in our case, we, we, we use mostly retrospective data. So we have um, uh, retrospect retrospective data for the, all those who were identified, um, for all of those who we surveyed, and then for the that's participant subset, we have a few variables that were collected at that time. So we can also do a randomization check of just that specific list and see if there's a difference between winners and non-winners on that list. So I'll spare you looking at tables of most of it. So let me just point out that. Uh, so we, I think in all we checked 25 or 30 different, um, uh, different indicators to see if they were the same on average across the groups. And so this table is looking at um, uh, the, the sample that we surveyed. And so for each one of these, these variables, we see the mean for the non-winners in this column with a standard deviation, and the, and the mean for the winners with their standard de de deviation. And then this column is showing us the difference between those two and testing if it's significant. Okay. So ideally, like there's no differences when you see a, a balance check that this, that this is the same uh, across the groups. The mean will be the same in the groups, uh, statistically speaking. So we do have one item that we find is unbalanced. Okay. So uh, this, this shows us that Muslims are more, more likely to be non-winners than winners. Right? And so, of course, this raises a flag, right? Like, so why, if it's just a, it's just a lottery, 
uh, you know, why would this happen, right? So it's, it's perfectly possible that it actually does happen, right? You can get what we consider a bad draw that uh, on one characteristic, it's unbalanced, even though the lottery happened, okay? Um, and so just to, to verify that there wasn't something more going on, given that this is Ahmedabad, um, we did ask in the survey, you know, did you think that the lottery was done fairly? Okay, and so kind of unsurprisingly, people were like more likely to say it was unfair when they were, didn't win, right? So winning is correlated with thinking the lottery was done fairly, but there's no difference for Muslims, right? So Muslims aren't more likely to say that it was done unfairly. So we, uh, we, this gives us some com comfort that it's you know, essentially a bad draw on this variable. And what we do is when we're running regressions later, in one of the versions of the regressions, we have a set of controls, and this is one of the control variables that we include. So just to, to see in a regression f uh, setup, uh, our basic strategy is to compare the winners and the non-winners um, for some outcome y, for many outcomes y. And so this is just what the regression equation looks like. And then in another set, we'll have covariates. And this is what the regression looks like, where we're adding in the, the, the covariates. And so we're running these on a couple of different samples. One sample is all of the people we surveyed. In some cases where the lottery participant, the BD worker, is, has died. We, uh, in those cases, we surveyed her husband first. Sorry, the, uh, the re preferred replacement was a daughter, and if there was no daughter in the house, then a husband, the husband. Um, but there are some questions that d don't make sense to ask if the <coughs> participant's no longer alive. So um, in some cases, the sample size will be just the women who are still alive. And then we also have questions about kids. So we have right now, uh, 701 sons and 577 daughters of the original participants. Okay. So um, I'll just take a minute to, to explain how this, what the table is showing, um, because I'm going to show you, now we're turning to results, I can show you a series of six or seven tables, and the, the pattern is the same. So essentially on these tables, we have like uh, a, a label here that's going to show you a group of, of outcomes. These are the actual outcome variables. This first column is showing the mean for non-winners. And then this, is, this column is showing you, from that first regression equation, this is the beta. Right? So this is showing us what the difference is for the groups that, for the winners. Um, and these asterisks are showing us if it's a statistically significant difference. Okay? This is the same thing, but it's the model with the covariates. And so when I talk about these, when we talk about it also in the paper, we talk, we refer to these, uh, to this column of results, these, these uh, coefficients. So first here we're looking at, actually, like, did the lottery affect housing itself, right? Did it actually get you better, better quality housing 14 or 15 years after the, um, after the random assignment? Okay, so the first thing here is, did they ever live in we call it colony A, and they're much more likely to have lived in colony A. So about 60, like I mentioned, about 67% ever moved to the new colony. Um, the average length of time there, spe time spent there was about six and a half years for the winners. Um, the years that they've owned a house is also a little bit higher. And this one though, amenity index, so this is over the past 15 years weighted by the time that they're in the house, there's no difference. And fraction of the neighborhoods in which a woman can walk alone safely up to 11 p.m. is just a measure of safety, some measure of neighborhood quality, and there's no difference there. So we do see a difference in actually relocating and, and um, years owning a house, but not, nothing really in the kind of uh, neighborhood characteristics. This set on the bottom is looking at current housing or the housing that they were living in uh, when the participant died if, if she's passed away. Um, Right, so they're still, you know, much more likely to, to live in, in colony A. The winners are more likely. They're slightly more likely to own a house 15 years later, so it increase, increases home ownership uh, longer term. But what's also interesting here is that even those who didn't win a house have essentially almost caught up. Right, so this is 70. Per this means 70 percent of non-winners own a house when we survey them in 2007, right? So it's, it's a pretty high rate of om om ownership for women who are starting out in Charles as BD workers. Um, so the, having a title isn't, isn't any different. Uh, the title actually being in the respondent's name because that's one of the program characteristics that the, 
the ownership document should be in the woman's name. That's more likely if they're owning the house through this lottery. And this, this at the bottom is a durable construction index. And this is a summary measure for three indicators of the construction of the roof, the materials of the roof, the materials of the floor, and the materials of the wall. And so we see that now the houses that they're living in are like better construction. So in terms of actually having an impact on owning a house and living in a better house, there's, a, there's still a long-term impact, small but a long-term impact of that. Uh, so with our GPS data, we can map out where houses, where people were living in 1987 and in 2000. So you cannot see this at all, I, unfortunately, like the because of the, the projector. But essentially, uh, between this map is 1987 and this map is 2007, um, between the two, I can at least point out to you that this is the this is the old city. This is the airport and this is the new colony, right? So this is what we're talking about is urban periphery. And so th it's a little bit hard to tell here, but there's basically a suburbanization. Like people are more likely to live farther from the city center when you're looking at when, when they're winners, right? So they're more likely to live farther from the city center. Okay. And we can uh, confirm this with the regression results, right? So this is looking at uh, distance from the center of the old city, um, miles from the son's house, so these are adult sons, wherever they're living, their distance to the house, to the center of the old city, that's also uh, higher for winners, and miles from the daughter's house to the center of old city is also slightly higher for winners, right? So everybody in the household is uh, slightly farther out from the center as a result of this lottery. Okay? And here, this is showing us that average time to walk to the nearest government hospital is showing us that there's um, you know, so m lower access to public facilities also as a result of this relocation to the urban periphery. Okay, at least in terms of hospitals, but not in terms of schools. Okay. So we don't see, surprisingly, any differences between winners and non-winners in terms of income. And we're looking at uh, total household as well as the individuals within the household. There's no difference long-term in income. And when we look at other measures of economic well-being, such as consumption, uh, savings and loans, labor force participation in terms of being employed or hours worked or husband's commute to work, we don't see, uh, we either see no effect or no important effect in these areas, right? So long term, there's no impact of ha getting a better house on the, on the periphery if your economic opportunities in this case. So we're also looking, as I said, at some children's outcomes. So I'm going to skip this slide. Um, but essentially, we're looking at them for daughters and sons uh, s separately. And we don't see any effect on kids long term in terms of all of these things. Years of education completed, number of schools attended, uh, labor force participation as adults, or BD-related health problems as adults. It's so, so. Okay. so now I think we just have a couple of minutes. I'll just finish up with the kind of social indicators. So here we're looking at, we asked them, about people who live in the house in front of you, the house behind you, the house to the left of you, and the house to the right of you, and uh, and some questions then about each of those houses. Okay, so most of the, most of our respondents reported that they had about three neighbors out of these four, and it's not different between winners and non-winners. And so for the winners, you see that the neighbors less likely to be from the same caste or from the same religion if they're Muslim, and it's more likely that someone in their house rolls beadies. And so it looks like a network is kind of being more concentrated in terms of occupation, but you're less likely to have people around you who are your same caste, which is the traditional way of, uh, of, of living. Um, ever socialize is high uh, for, for non-winners. 95% for 95 of these kind of ho houses, these neighbor households, you say you, you ever socialize with them. It's slightly higher for winners, but it's high for everybody. Okay, and they're equally likely to say that they socialize daily or I can rely on them in an emergency. Okay. So uh, the first indicator here for social activity is that do they have someone to talk to or visit at home? It's the same. Um, and that person, though, if they have someone, it's more likely to be their neighbors, right? So this is all showing a kind of... Uh, you know, at least a we weekly showing a concentration of like social activity in your neighborhood with people who are more likely your occupation but less likely your caste. 
um, in terms of risk sharing, uh, the winners are less likely to have somebody that they can borrow, borrow from or that they lend to. Um, but then the conditional on having someone, uh, they're as likely to be from the same neighborhood, from the same caste, and, but they've known them a shorter time, a shorter time frame. And then finally, I think I'll just finish with this slide and then wrap up, um, is looking at social insurance. Right? So we asked them, you know, Ahmedabad has had several kind of big, like, natural disasters that they had to face. So it's, there's a flood, there's an earthquake, and then there's also riots. And so we asked them, you know, were you exposed to these uh, natural disasters? And then did anybody help you? Did anybody provide assistance informally after this? So we see that everybody was is likely to have experienced the shock. Uh, they experienced the same number of shocks. Uh, the amount of work they lost following the shocks is about the same, right? So basically showing us the exposure to the shocks is the same. But if you're a winner, the average number of shocks for which you receive informal help is zero. Right? So there's no informal help, and informal help was of zero monetary value uh, if you're winners, right? So it looks like you're cut off from actually getting help informally when there's a, a natural disaster. Right? And Finally, uh, just, just give me two minutes, okay? Because um, we're almost near the end. So in terms of collective action, we're asking them, do you still belong to the BD union? And do you still attend meetings? So this is collective action across the city, right? Outside of your neighborhood. And they're just as likely to belong, but they're much like, uh, they're less likely to have actually attended a meeting, right? So it looks like they're kind of relying on others, kind of free riding on, on the union membership what, of what others are doing. But then when we look at collective action within the neighborhood, we see that there's more collective action within the neighborhood, right? So neighbors have worked together to solve a common problem in the last three years. It's, uh, the mean is 19.19 for non-winners and 0.38 uh, um, for winners, right? So there's more collective action within the neighborhood and less collective action across. I'm gonna skip this. And just basically, I'll, I'll wrap up here because I'm, I'm out of time, but um, I just wanted to make a couple of, of points about the policy implications of this. So it's a lot of, a lot of outcomes to try to, to synthesize it one, in one go, but essentially we you know, don't see much action, don't see much happening at all on income, on livelihoods, on kids' education, on health. Like none of those kind of standard things that we would expect the housing lottery would have an impact on, we just don't see. And then what we do see is potentially something kind of uh, you know, harmful in terms of social networks. If, the, if you actually have some disaster where you need the people around you to be able to, uh, to ensure you, makes it harder. If everybody is, co you know, if we live in the same neighborhood, you know, we're good friends and I'm willing to help you in a disaster and you're willing to help me, that's great. There's an explosion and, and that explosion is right? So it looks like there's more concentration within the neighborhood and people are more willing to help each other, have good relationships, interact together. But when the time comes, they may not actually be able to help because of these spatially correlated, correlated risks. So, so just kind of back to housing and back to evaluation for a minute. Um, I wanted to point out that you know one of the the benefits of doing this impact evaluation is that if we did a process evaluation, at least a process evaluation with existing documents, without any kind of survey of, of other um, you know f survey to get other data, it would look like the the program is really successful, right? Because on the books, everybody took the house. People are paying back the mortgages. You go to the you go to the uh, the colony. All of the houses are there. People are living in the houses. So, like on the books and with existing data, you, you would get a very different impression of the program than you would if you're if you're doing this kind of impact analysis and getting more data through the survey. Um, so I have skipped the qualitative analysis, but beneficiaries also reported that they were struggling with commuting costs, both in terms of time. Uh, lots of people were like bicycling back to the old city, like taking an hour to ride a bicycle back. Um, and if not, then taking a bus and, and paying money that they weren't used to paying to, to commute back. So if you're thinking about a, a program like this, you know, there may be some complementary investments in transportation are required, right? If you're going to move people to the edge of the city, should probably make sure that there's a decent bus. <laughs> um, 
Right, so point three I've already mentioned, so I'll just close with point four, which is a, you know, a different uh, and potentially uh, different kind of policy implication and not, you know, really related to, to the results here. But, you know, in this kind of slum development, uh, you know, slum relocation kind of framework, trying to deal with, deal with what do we do with the slum population, it's always, you know, do you build additional services for them in the slum? Like, do you, do you make the slum a livable place or do you move people out? And so, Another way to think about this is, you know, could we have smaller uh, places in central locations housing more people because they're innovations in design, you know, where we can build up to a cer certain certain number of floors but still have houses that are livable and that th that people will uh, people will accept. And you could, you know, essentially, for these kind of things to work, we have to have major pushes on the supply side of things in terms of like there's just not a lot of apartments for <laughs> for very low income people to. Uh, to rent, right? So we could think about it, kind of architectural innovations to help increase the supply if they're accompanied by, uh, like, some rental guarantees or some some down down payments. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, I just wanted to know whether you had any uh, qualitative data, any kind of data in what it did to the women, because I'm assuming that the uh, patta or the deed in this lottery would be in the women's name, and whether beyond the schooling and other things that you spoke about, what did it do in terms of their own security, their bargaining power, what did it do to violence, do you have any data on that, having the security of a house? and an asset in their name. Just to add to uh, my colleague's uh, question, I mean, it seems that uh, there wasn't an impact, a, ma a major impact that you noticed, uh, whatever the walk of life may have been. But I was hoping to see uh, uh, some data on health indicators because you pointed out that, you know, they moved from fairly unsanitary conditions to a, a condition where there was pipe water supply and sanitary toilets and so on. So did you gather some data on this? And in this case, people were, like, they're, in, they're coming from the old city area, but they're not from one location. So these 497 women are kind of spread out, and then um, some of them get picked out and moved to a concentrated area, right? So it's kind of the opposite, rather than them being not opposite, but from one concentration to another. So I, you know, there's actually just nothing that we can say from the study about, you know, what happened to the old neighborhoods because there are just so few people being taken from from neighborhoods that we wouldn't expect an impact. Uh, yeah. So I think this question you've asked is really interesting. Like, what happened? Because theoretically, we would think that. Uh, having a property right in a woman's name should increase bargaining power. There should be some kind of empowerment effect of this. And so the data that we have, we're looking at um, some the, some some pretty uh, kind of standard questions on like who makes decisions about uh, you know different things, particularly like in in relation to spending decisions. Like, do you participate? And in those, we were surprised to see that we don't see any difference between the winners and the non-winners, between those who have the have a property right and those who don't. So in terms of qualitative data, though, we do see that, um, you know, people are, are expressing, you know, a, a relief and I think a stress reduction 
in terms of like having a secure place to live you know so it's not so much about you know the strength of the property right for them it's just that i ha it's you know it's not about strong property rights versus weak it's renting versus owning right and for them like just owning your own home is such a you know a major kind of stress reliever and and makes them feel more uh, more stable so it's not actually coming from the the so it's coming from ownership but not through the kind of uh, intra-household bargaining negotiation uh, that you know when we look for it we didn't we didn't see that and then so yeah so there's actually a lot of a lot of questions we have on health and I didn't show you them into them too in the tables I just showed a summary result because there's absolutely no differences right so we're looking at particularly things that are related to um, particularly respiratory kind of infections and ailments because you would think that in a closed kind of chawl environment where because they're beady rollers there's tobacco dust in the air you would expect that people have brown lung or black lung and that that actually is one of the reasons they wanted to build better houses is that you could get people away from from that but we don't see any reductions long term in uh, in in those health indicators or in you know kind of other general health indicators about kind of what I would call occupational health so if they're uh, beady rollers and they're sitting you know for four hours in a day in the same place doing the same motion you would expect arthritis and back aches and and you know neck pains and we don't see any reduction in that but everybody's still rolling beaties so you, you wouldn't expect to see a, a, a difference a difference in that since uh, you said there is a uh, this is a retrospective data you have collected uh, what, what is the impact of such kind of a design where you are you are randomization you are saying a randomization uh, randomized control trial but it is a retrospective way. So, what, what effect you would have uh, seen or have observed over? Okay. Kavita from NCRT. So, actually, uh, it was quite interesting to listen to your presentation. But, uh, uh, you know, in between when you said actually that uh, uh, those people had to spend less on the EMIs, EMIs now and they were paying more as rent. But when you are giving your recommendation, you sort of uh, uh, then you are telling that you know somewhere uh, that uh, they were commuting uh, you know longer distances and they need to you now spend more amount. So you know how was it actually affecting them? Maybe you know they, if they need to sp they were spending more money. Was it equivalent to that now? Was was it more than that with what they were spending earlier on rent as rent? So was it yes, actually you know the kind of. Uh, um, they were owning a house that pride was there or even financially and physically and health wise also they were at loss maybe that you could not monitor you were you might not be able to monitor in a short span of time but you know going longer distances commuting for longer distances and coming and spending more money maybe how does it affect their you know financially their health and all maybe the impact could be in in it will take more years you know to uh, to assess that Possibly, I don't think so. That within a short short span of time, you may not be able to monitor that. Okay, and then one more. We'll take one more round. Okay, so why don't we? Okay, just a very uh, one general question. If you're doing the baseline, um, you know, after the fact, is it necessary to have as um, as many in the control group as in the treatment group? I mean, do you have to match it one for one? That's my first question. My second question is, when you're looking at this in a retrospective way, is the, are there issues of recall when you're constructing the baseline? Okay. So let me answer the first and the third together. So, so we're actually, like, while we're building this history, what we're looking at for most of our outcomes is actually just the, it's, it, you should think of it as we have the end line, right? We have an end line survey. We don't have a baseline, okay? So, but because of the randomization, it should be that the differences you observe in the end line are, are still because of the treatment, right? So uh, what we show you in the, in the balance check is that these groups are the same on average at the beginning, right? So, there's no, so that means that even if we had the baseline data, you should expect that those are the same on average at baseline also. Okay. So the advantage of the baseline, you know, is, is that you can do something that's still like a difference in difference with essentially within the RCT. That's the, that's the normal design, that you can have more precise estimates of, uh, of the impact when you have the baseline and the end line. But the end line results are still valid because you're, you know, uh, because the groups are the same on average at the beginning. Okay. And so the, the questions for, th for this aren't the, in terms of, of design and sample size, it, it doesn't, you know, there's no particular, 
uh, difference in terms of you, you know, you, so when you're thinking about sample size, you have a power calculation, you try to figure out like, you know, what sample size do I need to see a certain effect size given uh, the characteristics of, you know, the standard deviation around the outcome. And I, I think you, you guys will, must know this. So there's nothing particular about just having the end line that will change the, the, the size of control, control and treatment groups. Okay, Anand. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to answer one question. Do you mind if I... Uh, yeah, so actually, I mean, we're doing this 15 years after the, after the fact, right? So this isn't considered a short time frame in terms of evaluating a, a housing program. It's actually a long term. It's a long term. Uh, you may, maybe you'll consider it middle, uh, you know, midterm, but it, it's actually not a short term impact. So, you know, these kind of things that, you know, so I think one of the, the questions you were asking is about, you know, spending in terms of, uh, spending on rent and spending on commuting. So we don't see any differences in terms of spending on commuting. We don't see any differences in terms of, of income. Um, and so most pe most of them are actually actually own their houses at the at the end line, right? So we don't actually have uh, you know an easy like a, a clear clean way to compare spending when we're talk comparing some who own, combining some who own and some who rent. Um, but we certainly like don't see any, Im you know, we don't see any impact on health 15 years later. But yeah, absolutely, it, there's something that that could take longer than that to to uh, to come to the surface. And and you know, if we're 30 years after, maybe there's something that that will come up. Okay. Sorry. No, no, uh, no. So let me just uh, clarify right now that if you won the house, everybody who won the house claimed the house. They just didn't go live in it, right? So there was no mis no mixing between winners and non-winners in terms of who actually then got the got the mortgage. Sorry, do we have one more question? Uh, it was a nice presentation. Uh, uh, I'm Rohit uh, from Room to Read. A really basic question I like to put you. That is uh, regarding the sampling procedure. That you have uh, described that is that is a lottery method used for selection of this uh, those who own the house. But still, a question arises. We have uh, technology savage. We we are using modern technology and other things. Still, so many questions arises when you uh, think about the uh, lottery method. There are so many weak points. You can say other factors uh, simultaneously working when you go for the randomization with lottery. Can you explain why did you choose the method? Why the other methods are not used during the times of other randomization processes are also there? You could have used that process. And you know there are so many other uh, factors are also affecting during the process you go for the lottery. And it is not a very weak sample. It is 476 like so. So can you explain this? Uh, so why don't I just uh, start with that, uh, just because I want to make sure the first that I understand the the, the question. Um, so, I th so is the the question like why actually do we want to go for this to this lottery? What does it do for us? Or because um, you mentioned something about some, you know, other other randomization process, I didn't actually understand uh, understand the point. Randomization itself means uh, that is very basic principles that you know everybody has the equal chance to be selected. My basic point is that, but uh, when you go for the randomization, suppose put the all the uh, uh, parts in that bracket, I 100% will write something that uh, there are so many things are there inside. Will there is so many points are there. The people are here and more higher up about it. That no, uh, even a few percent of the parts would not have that much of equality to be selected. And other points are also there. If you go for and you go, you will think about it. You will find. I think so. 
and some other process are the you, you could have used the uh, other software techniques uh, uh, through which you can select the sample. Okay, so this lot was done by Seva Union, right? So this is uh, Seva in 1993, and their goal to um, to be be transparent, right? So they used use this actual like physical lottery so that they could stand in public in front of 497 women. Those women could all make sure their names were in the bucket, and then somebody who they trusted could could take it out, right? So. Um, if, if part of the point you're raising is that there are actually multiple ways you can randomize, and I think that's a very good point. And usually, when we're doing RCTs, we don't use a bucket, right? <laughs> right? We we use software, and we uh, you know use a random number generator, and uh, you know pick treat, assign people the treatment and control that way. Be something more or less when you are taking the. You are going for the randomization one not at a single moment. You are going for random for one time, this time the probability of taking particular unit from the bucket mm. is different from the others. Okay, so your question, your <laughs> point is about replacement, okay. Uh, just to let you know that randomization was a technique used in house allotments in various parts of India which was questioned and was found to be, you know, uh, biased. I mean, there is manipulation possible if you're using software. So many, many organizations which were allotting houses for public welfare, they done away with randomization. I mean, they have gone in for the, I mean, because this is uh, foolproof. I mean, this cannot be tampered it's with. It's transparent, right? So there are many who still do randomization, but I, I think they, and, and some who just don't use randomization at all, right? So for some uh, housing authorities, the idea is they prefer like a first in, first out, or, you know, try to try some other method. You know, this is, you know, partly driven by, you know, say was, uh, you know, say was idea at the time wasn't to study, to create a study, uh, pool, but it was just to like do what they thought was most acceptable and most fair, and it turned out it's a good way for us to just to study the program. So some places I've seen, like Auda still does um, like computerized lotteries. They have a large program where they've got like 22,000 house, households applying, and every time they build a new location, they use the, the software to, uh, to pick the beneficiaries. And, uh, but I saw last year the kind of a district collector's office near Hyderabad, oh, actually them uh, doing a physical lottery with like small chits and a, a tiny urn and, and doing it, you know. So there's lots of variations in, in how it's actually done. Um, and so Anand was uh, reiterating a point that, that I mentioned is one of the, and his question is when you have a lot of, of indicators, it could just be by uh, statistical chance that some of those indicators you find are, um, are, um, are significant, right? Rather than there actually be some, being some kind of, of true results, right? So, uh, you know, one reason we don't think that's happening is that actually we see the specific pattern of results. We should see actually probably, there's no reason why if it's by statistical chance that the, the results are grouped in a, in a way that, that fits, a, fits a theory. Um, and then also that's the one of the reasons we do combine measures and, and uh, a lot of these outcomes are actually indices rather than just individual measures. So it gives us a little more, more confidence when we're using the index uh, outcomes rather than just the individual. I'm sorry, but I don't think we have any time for any more questions. So thank you, Sharon. Um, it gives me. Our next speaker is Mudit Kapoor, who will present an example of quasi-experimental approach. Mudit Kapoor is an assistant professor of economics and a research fellow at the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. He has formerly worked at the World Bank as a consultant. His academic papers have been published in the Journal of Econometrics, Regional Service and Urban Economics, Journal of Financial Intermediation, and BE Journal of Economic Analysis and Policy. He is also working in the area of informal finance. His recent research on chit funds as an innovative access for finance for low-income households is funded by a grant from the Gates Foundation. At present, Professor Kapoor is writing a chapter on economic growth, poverty, and reforms in Andhra Pradesh. He is also a contributor to the research in the Columbia program on Indian economic policies. Welcome, Mundit. Uh, yeah, this is very. Uh, firstly, uh, John, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this round table. You know, these two set of speakers, you know, John and Ch they sort of, they've rendered me speechless. And as a speaker, if I'm speechless, then I don't know what I'll be doing for the next 30 minutes. But I think uh, we've had a very good start from John on what my talk is going to be about. And as I understood it, John has already pointed out, even before I 
talked about my uh, research, what the limitations of my work is. You know, he's talked about the limitations and difference and difference. But before I get into the, the question that I'm trying to address and the technique that I use, uh, I just want to say, you know, a, a few things about, you know, the, the way I've thought about development since I see that we are in a room full of people who care about poverty, development, and, and evaluation is one way to figure out whether things are working or not. So while I was graduating, you know, as an economics student, it occurred to me that our field, you know, e e uh, the economics field is governed by two fundamental laws. To every economist, there's an equal and an opposite economist. And the second law was that both of them are wrong. And now I've added the third thing, you know, while I was graduating, there was this randomized control trial, you know, the revolution had started. I mean, we miraculously discovered, even though the, you know, RCTs have existed for a long time, but somehow we stumbled upon it, and I'm glad that we stumbled upon it. And what it did was something even more interesting. Now, you know, now I thought as a graduate, you know, as an economics graduate, that finally, we will have answers to those questions. We will be able to find a magic bullet that will sort of solve the problem in the most scientific way possible. And what's really interesting is that what, you know, after reading about our cities, the research that was coming out, it turned out that what we thought was commonsensical in terms of providing solutions to poverty, those kind of things don't work. And what works, we don't have an explanation for. Right, I mean, that, that's what, so now I'm a bit more confused, but a bit more enlightened, I would say. So now I can say that I'm a confused, enlightened economist, you know. So this, you know, this work is a sort of a bigger question related to these issues on development. And the bigger question essentially has to do with, uh, you know, it has to deal with poverty. And one of the things that has struck me, you know, in the, you know, while studying the issue of poverty is that in the last 20 to 30 years, if there is anything that has worked in terms of reduction in poverty, it is, you know, while I'm studying states like Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, you'll be surprised to know that 20 years back, for example, Andhra Pradesh was as poor as Uttar Pradesh. You know, you look at any economic figures, but today, when you look at it in terms of poverty reduction, Andhra Pradesh is way ahead of Uttar Pradesh. You know, it's, it's, and what has happened out there is, in some sense, they've introduced economic growth, they've introduced reforms, they've had a good luck of leadership in some sense that has been, you know, encouraging reforms and growth, and today there's a huge difference. Now, unfortunately, such large macro programs you know, they cannot be evaluated using a randomized control trial. I mean, imagine 23 years ago when there was no IT sector in Andhra Pradesh, would we do an RCT to evaluate, you know, should IT sector be promoted or should the IT sector not be promoted in Andhra Pradesh? I mean, that's not possible, right? So, you know, when, when I use an evaluation method, I think I'm cognizant of the fact that, there, that what the limitations of the evaluation methods are, what matters is the question, and then what is the best evaluation method that exists to sort of address the question? So yes, my talk is going to be based on an evaluation method, which is questionable. But nevertheless, the question that I'm trying to address is sort of, uh, a, sort of a big question. It's a big picture question in some sense. Now, what is the big picture question out here? Though the title is very specific, it's financial constraints and exporting firms. But the big picture question is, in context of India's development, if you look at the share of India's GDP, a large share of it comes from the service sector, uh, uh, then comes the agricultural sector, and then you have the manufacturing sector. But if you look at the share in terms of employment, agricultural sector far dominates the other two sectors. So now one of the big question in India's development story is that how do we move employment from the agricultural sector to industry and to the service sector. So if you were to look at the question, if you were to think of this question, why has that not happened already? Where a large share of output has moved to the service sector, why hasn't employment been able to move into the industry or the service sector? That question still remains a sort of a mystery when it comes to the India's development context. And 
looking at this big picture question, I thought it might be interesting to look at what constrains, in some sense, the manufacturing sector. Because you look at any country's economic development. I mean, you look at the miracle of China. Even there, you know, which, I mean, it's a, it's, I mean, I've studied China, I have a paper on it. It's amazing, it's unprecedented in terms of economic development, how many people they have been able to move from agricultural sector to the manufacturing sector. 300 million people in the last 20 to 25 years. That's the entire workforce of European countries and America combined. That is the magnitude of change that has happened in a country like China. Whereas in India, when it comes to in terms of employment, we've not seen that change. So then the question as an economist, it, it occurs to us is that if we are a labor abundant country, and if you know, we should have experienced a sort of a labor intensive manufacturing sector revolution, after the reforms were introduced in 1991. If you think about it, much of the reforms in 1990s were aimed at the manufacturing sector. You know, they were liberalizing the manufacturing sector. So then what, in some sense, constrains the manufacturing sector? So that was the sort of the big question that I was, looking, I was trying to look at. Now, it is here in trying to address some of this big question, I stumbled upon something which is much more specific in nature, which is, what is the impact of credit constraints on exporting firms? Now, I look at exports for a very specific reason. One is data availability, you know, what, you know, the access of data that I had available to, some of the theories that are available that can be easily tested. And credit constraint is one of the big issues in the Indian context. We believe somehow or the other that firms in India are not able to grow because they are credit constrained. Now, this is a theoretical question. It still needs to be empirically tested. You know, there are many theoretical questions. I'll give you one more example related to credit constraint, which we might be very familiar with, those people who know microfinance. And, you know, people believe, you know, one of the biggest, you know, microfinance is a magic bullet for poverty uh, reduction and growth. Because if you, you know, what is ailing these small enterprises is credit. You give them credit and magically they'll begin to grow. So microfinance will step in and that's how it will happen. Now, if you think of it, you know, I mean, this comes from a very specific theoretical, uh, you know, argument, economic argument that there are different types of people. Some people have good projects, the other have bad projects. We cannot distinguish between who has good and bad projects, but somehow or the other, if we are able to identify who these guys are, you give them credit and that's it. You know, every, everything will be taken care of. Economic growth, poverty, all those issues will be handled. But the strong assumption is that people have projects. I mean, forget about that. Poor people many a times might not actually have economically viable projects. But nevertheless, you know, it remains a question, what is the impact of credit constraints? So we decide, so this is one of the sort of a paper in my larger agenda on looking at the manufacturing sector, which is what, I'm, but the motivation is this large question of what is preventing the growth of the manufacturing sector in India? So this is a joint work with Priya and uh, Jibunen. Priya is at UC Irvine, and uh, Jibunen is at uh, East Ing Inglia, or Norwich, okay. Uh, now in India, you know, we have something very interesting. I mean, it's, it's, India has been trying to solve its poverty problem maybe even before independence, you know, one of the big issues has been. And somehow or the other, it feels that by providing subsidies to the rich or to the poor, it will be able to solve this problem of poverty. And India has had, for a very long period of time, you know, India has sort of tried to provide subsidies to these small manufacturers. They have tried to provide some kind of financial assistance to these small manufacturers so that in some sense, these small manufacturers, you know, when they are provided, you know, after all, who else will give money to these guys? If the government provides it with the hope, these guys will generate employment and growth. The second question related to this was the trade finance linkage. Now, we know after experience of China and the Southeast Asian countries, that all countries that have had export-oriented growth policies have seen a dramatic decline or reduction in poverty, dramatic improvement in economic welfare in those countries. So one big question is that what is the trade finance linkage? In some sense, what kind of benefits have these governments provided to exporters which have allowed them to grow, generate employment and growth? 
And the third question when it comes very specific to, the, to our study is that in the last decade or so, export as a proportion of GDP has grown very significantly. You know, till 2000, export as a percentage of GDP was nothing to write home about, but after 2000, something very dramatic has happened. So what, you know, what are the factors that are promoting this? And 2000 to 2010 is also a very dramatic period when you think about it in terms of poverty reduction. I'm, I mean, ours is one of the first studies which looks at poverty reduction across states. And what we are noticing is the states that have promoted growth, that have promoted reforms, are also the states where poverty reduction across board, whether it is scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, Muslims, poverty reduction has had the maximum impact precisely in those states. But coming back to my very specific study, you know, in this case, because I'll talk a bit about the valuation, it's going to focus on exports at the moment. What is the literature? Well, I have Banerjee and Duplo listed right at top. Makes sense, right, John? I mean, this revolution is started by Banerjee and Duplo. So I should have reference to them, but there's a genuine reference out here. You know, they are one of the first people to look at the impact of credit constraints. Then in the context of trade literature, there has been a lot of work in looking at what the impact of credit constraints on firms is. And let me give you a brief background, you know, just from an economics uh, you know, from, from an economic perspective, why credit constraint matters. Think of two firms, you know, which are exactly identical. But for one firm gets access to cheaper credit vis-a-vis -vis the other. So what would you expect in the firm that gets access to cheaper credit? That firm will grow, right? Now, if these two firms are competing with each other, what would you expect? This firm will be able to get resources away from the firm that doesn't get access to cheap credit. But what would be the impact in terms of overall, product, overall output and employment if you had a policy like this? The overall economic theory tells us, and very justifiably, the overall productivity in a country which is pursuing policies like this, the overall productivity would come down. The overall level of output, that is the aggregate output of all the firms that got subsidized credit versus that did not get, would be lower if actually the subsidies were not there. The overall employment would also be very different. So now, in some sense, what this subsidized credit does is that when you select firms, give them subsidies, and to the other firms you don't give them subsidies, in many ways you are actually restraining output and employment growth opportunities. Right? The reason is, the, where, where, did, where did this logic come from? You know, when, when our great policy thinkers, you know, when they were designing this policy of these subsidies, what they had in mind was a very precise definition of competition. You know, in economics, you know how we define perfect competition? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're aware that companies produce homogeneous products and there's perfect information. So everybody knows about everything. That's how we define competition. So these guys took that literally and they said, instead of one guy cornering pro production, what if we divided production among smaller guys? So that way we will have better welfare, they won't be a monopolist. So in some sense, they were actually using theory, you know, to sort of design the policy if you wish to speak. But where they were wrong was in the actual functioning of economics. We know today that firms are not homogenous. We know that even within a narrowly defined industry, you can have a firm that is far more productive than the other firm. Now, you might question as economists, then why don't resources move to a single firm that is the most productive? Well, unfortunately, there could be capacity constraints. I can think of many reasons why this will not happen. But nevertheless, you know, this, th that was the thinking that they had. And they said, you know what? We are going to provide these subsidies, or we are going to restrict production. Instead of giving it to large firms, we will restrict production to small firms. So imagine a firm, you know, if I were a very productive guy, I was being told that, look, you're very productive. Or let's say Sharon was very productive and I'm not that productive. Sharon was being told, you cannot produce more than a certain limit. So now what that does was that was subsidizing the small inefficient producers. So what would you expect in an economy like this? There wouldn't be much of employment growth. You wouldn't see much of output. And this is what we actually see today in the economy, even after repeated subsidies, look at the share of the manufacturing sector, it still remains very small. 
So these are some of the studies, but let me get quickly to what we do and the evaluation method. We exploit a natural experiment by a change in the government policy for subsidized credit. So in 1998, you know, we were going through the reform process. One day the government decided, you know what, we have all this priority sector lending, you know, to small scale industries. So they said, okay, fine, we will change the definition of small scale industries. So they knew the limitation of this policy. So they said, okay, fine, you know, I mean, without creating much of a political uh, situation, let's redefine the small scale industry. And the definition that they used, uh, the, the definition that they used was that all the firms that had investment in plant and machinery less than 6.5 million, that was how they were defining it. In 1998, they expanded that. They said, okay, fine, if you have investment in plant and machinery of 30 million or less, you, know, you are now eligible for subsidized credit. So now think of a situation, a firm that had grown, that had higher investment in plant and machinery. Now it could compete with these uh, smaller firms to get the subsidized credit as well, right? And then in 2000, the government realized that they have gone very far because many firms in many industries now were eligible for subsidized credit. So they reversed the policy altogether. So the good thing about this sort of a natural experiment in some sense is it allows you to measure to a certain extent, of course, the limitation that has been pointed out by John, which is that, okay, fine, when a firm gets access to subsidized credit, what happens? And if a firm, if the subsidized credit is removed from, you know, if, you, if the firm is removed from the eligibility of the subsidized credit, then what happens? Now, this allows us to study several things, you know, this natural experiment. It allows us to study, for example, do firms expand output? It allows us to study, do firms hire more people, right? It also allows us, and something which I'm not going to emphasize much right now, I'm not going to talk, get too much into the detail of the results, but it also allows us to a certain extent measure what happens to something which we call the total factor productivity. What is total factor productivity? Total factor productivity is a measure of how efficiently firm converts its input into output. That is what it measures. Does that go up on an average or not, right? Now, this experiment is neat on several fronts. Why? Firstly, the government was, by providing a subsidy, it was sub in some sense implicitly encouraging firms to remain small, right? Imagine a firm that if the subsidy was not there, would have grown to, would have had investment in plant and machinery, let's say of 6.8 million or 6.7 million, now it will say, you know what, why should I grow? Because if I grow, then I'll have to give up the subsidy. Now the benefit of subsidy to the firm is far greater than optimally utilizing its size or whatever its capabilities are. So in some sense, what this policy was doing was, it was sort of al not allowing or restricting the firms to grow. Right? That is what this policy was doing in effect. Now, what this allows us is that now when more larger firms can get the subsidies, what it would do is it would move resources from smaller firms to larger firms, right? Because the prices have changed, because now it's possible to do it. And then we can also study the reverse of the policy. Now, suppose the firm was getting subsidized credit, and now it no longer gets the subsidized credit, what impact it's going to have? So where do we get our data from? We got our data from Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. This is the Prowess database. It's a, it's a sort of a large extensive database, but it's aimed more at uh, larger firms. It's not aimed at smaller firms. Okay. So what do, we, what do we measure? What is the difference in difference with John has, you know, John gave a very good description of difference in difference. And, you know, it, it, it will be pointless to repeat what he said. But let me tell you what I sort of try to do. So we have a control group. The control group essentially is all the firms that were not affected by this policy. Right? That is what a control group is. Then we have a treatment group. What is a treatment group? Treatment group is all the firms that are affected by the policy. Now, what are we interested in looking at? Let's say this outcome is sales of a firm. And 
this difference in log tells us the rate of growth of sales. You know, how fast are the firms growing, right? So now, what is the elementary economic theory behind it? If a firm is credit constrained, right, then basically it will take this extra subsidized credit it is getting, translate it into more output, right? That is what it would happen. Now, if the firm is not credit constrained, one could argue that essentially the output should not be affected because the firm is getting what it needs, right? So it doesn't really, this policy should have no effect whatsoever. So now, as John had pointed out, we needed a control group, right? A sort of a need control group. So what we did was we divided the control group into two categories of firms. One category of firms were very small firms, you know, firms that were always receiving subsidized credit. And one category of firms were those firms that were never eligible for subsidized credit. We also limited our attention on exporting firms, you know, on exporters, because the question we were trying to address, at least at a very micro level, was aimed at trade uh, finance linkage. So we restricted our attention to exporters or people or firms that have been exporting throughout in the sample. Why did we do that? Well, the reason is that exporters are more productive than non-exporters. So if there were any other issues affecting the rate of growth of firm, we sort of wanted to take that uh, factor out of our equation altogether. So what do we have out here? So we have a time trend. Size dummy essentially, it's, it's a, I mean, in econometrics, you know, dummy variable is a zero one type of a variable, but it's sort of an indicator in some sense whether a firm is eligible for subsidized credit or not. And when the policy is reversed, whether the firm is sort of, whether the firm gets or the subsidized credit is removed from the firm or not. So we have two phases. One is credit expansion and the other is credit contraction. And the parameter of interest for us is this interaction term. So do I have a board? I don't have a board, okay. I, I, I thought you said we, I'm gonna have a board. Anyway. Let me try to explain. You remember John, when he was talking about these trends, he was showing us that there's an intervention, then there will be a change in the trend because of the intervention. So the basic assumption out here is that when you have these trend parameters, the basic assumption is that the trend or the difference between the control and the treatment group, other than the intervention, nothing else happens after the intervention. Now, if for some strange reason, the larger firms or the smaller firms start doing anything differently other than the intervention, then perhaps we are overestimating the effect of the intervention. That is what, you know, the basic limitation when, when John was talking about the limitation. So what do we see essentially? Results are very obvious. When we look at the impact of the policy, we see that the rate, rate of growth, whether it is total bank borrowing or in terms of foreign exchange earnings, they go up, right? That, that is the fundamental result. Now, we do, we have large and small firms as control. We change the control of the firm. We look at only the priority sector. Whether you look at firms that are never a part of the priority sector, what you find essentially is that there is an impact of credit constraints on the rate of change of the, the, exp uh, the exports of the firm. I don't want to emphasize so much as much on the results because this, these results are aimed at a very different audience, you know, the trade finance type of an audience. But basically, the point I'm trying to make essentially is that resources now are moving from smaller firms to medium-sized firms, which is a very good thing when it comes to resource allocation. One of the fundamental reasons why, you know, I mean, economists, when they look at differences in economic performance across various countries, one of the factors that they have identified is what is called the total factor productivity, which means that resources are not being efficiently allocated across sectors within and across firms within an industry or across industries. So in other words, we have too much of resources being allocated to, in some sense, inefficient firms. What this result is telling us is that once you relax this subsidy, then resources begin to move to those firms who will be in a better position to utilize these resources. Now, we have the credit contraction. The good news is that when the government reversed the policy, 
it had no impact whatsoever on the firms that were affected by the policy. What does this, this tells us something very interesting about the banking sector. In India, unfortunately, the banking sector, you know, it's 70 to 80 percent of loans are made by public sector banks. The incentives for public sector banks are very different. You know, they are, they are much more worried about making bad loans because it is then, you know, all the inquiries will kick in. If they make a good loan, there's no incentives for them. You know, they're not really incentivized to make good loans, but they are prevented very, very seriously from making bad loans. What it does essentially is if you're a bank manager, you don't want to rock the boat. You don't care what the rates of returns are essentially. You just don't want to make new loans, especially to newer firms. But the interesting thing is that when you make the loans to these firms, either through a policy change, and if these guys have been repaying the loans on time, then there's no reason why the banking sector should not extend credit to them. So even though this policy was temporary in nature, what is really interesting is that it had a permanent impact in terms of resource allocation. Now, in economics parlance, we call this effect hysteresis. There are other terms that we use. You know, economists are good at using terms. But that was, in some sense, a key takeaway, that sometimes you need what, what we, you know, there's a book also that's come out on, you sort of need to nudge uh, the, the banking sector, and it brings about, some, in some sense, big changes. We look at employment, it has a major impact. We look at other economic factors where we think it matters. And what we see is that this policy change, even though it was temporary in nature, the policy was reversed, it sort of had a permanent impact. Very quickly, uh, key findings, expansion of subsidized credit, I've already spoken. Policy implications of our, you know, th these were the policy implications, but they were aimed more at the trade audience. Right, so that's, am I on time? We are running a little short of time, so we have time for just a few questions. Uh, before we start the question answer session, just a quick reminder could everyone please fill up their feedback forms? Hi. Uh, all right. So, um, so just like one quick question on uh, the the first table that you were showing. You you showed that uh, you have one of the outcome variable was like the forex earning, like the, the the amount of money you you earn, and then one of the contributing variable was like the dummy of the size. So I'm just like wondering how like for example the way I would see it is the fact that you're earning more money you're able to invest it back. So there could be a causality on the opposite direction, um, which is not the fact that you were able to, for example, like, you know, like if you are big, you probably earn like more money, but when you earn more money, you get bigger. So, you know, there is relationship going in both direction. So uh, that was my question. Like, how do you, how do you control for uh, the fact that, you know, you earn more money and you invest and you go bigger. So that's sort of see for some public sector banks whether in fact at the time of this credit expansion uh, you see something that would confirm uh, the theory you laid out for why you might see a hysteresis uh, effect. So I'm just wondering if that's possible. Yeah, uh, I didn't get your name. Uh, what, what's your name? Pankaj. Pankaj, you are absolutely right that firms will be making their investment, of course, from the sales and part of the profits will go into the investments that they will make. But that's precisely the point we are trying to make, that if firms are growing, then I agree with you that it's, we are perhaps overestimating the effect of policy alone in terms of credit. 
But keep in mind that when we are running a difference in difference, at the right hand side, we do not have total bank borrowing. We just have the intervention effect. So, in equilibrium, for example, it is absolutely when you sort of tease out the entire equilibrium, various factors are at effect. Firms own investments might be going up, cash holdings are going up, but the overall impact on sales, on uh, employment generation is what we are interested in, in terms of the policy intervention. But we are not, I am not going to make a claim that this is purely out of policy. The model essentially, and this is the limitation even of the RCTs as well, that you are only affecting, you are only looking at the intervention effect how the intervention eventually goes on, what is the general equilibrium impact in some sense, the way it, it might be very difficult to tease out, particularly in the linear specification I have used. See, these are a very linear model making the assumption that you have a constant returns to scale production function. I need to make it a bit more uh, complicated. But at this point, I was more interested in pointing out the average effect. So that is why you know you can take it over here that here is a sort of an impact of a policy, but no structural impact as such that is what would be needed to sort of address your, uh, your question. Regarding uh, Arshad, your question, uh, I think what, what we have done is we looked at the policy, let us say if it was introduced in 98, and then we look at the impact in 99, 2000. So sort of allow the year you know, in which the policy to sort of work its magic through if you wish to think of it. And then answering your question, I think what we look at is the total bank borrowing. So in some sense, the reason why I am making that claim is that the total bank borrowing is not affected after the policy reversal. And that is why I am making the claim that perhaps banks, when they are seeing that these guys are making all their repayments on time, there is nothing for the bank manager to change the relationship, even though the subsidized credit has been removed. So what the banks possibly, I mean, one thing we should possibly do is we should look at the interest payments. So what the bank can negotiate after the subsidized credit is removed, then what happens to the interest rate? You know, previously they are subsidized by a certain margin, but now they no longer be, they need not be subsidized. But as far as the overall bank borrowing is concerned, we, we do not see any impact whatsoever. But we will take that interest. Yes? Uh, uh, it is in today's papers that, uh, I mean, this is a slightly unrelated question, but I think you are the best person to ask. Uh, uh, certain uh, loans have been waived off uh, by the government in UP on the occasion of uh, Mr. Malam Singh's birthday. I was, uh, you know, and this keeps happening, I mean, every now and then loans are waived off. I mean, I was just trying to understand uh, what impact this kind of loan waivers has on the economy and the overall uh, loan repayment trends, if you may please. It is, uh, I, I will, ad first I will admit it is beyond my scope, but nevertheless, since you ask a question on UP, I must admit that I should answer because I am from UP and Akhilesh, as you know, uh, as you might not be aware, was actually an MP from my constituency and now his wife is an MP. So I, I feel an urge to answer because it perhaps has happened very close at home. The impact of this is, you know, I mean, it's 1,600, 1,700 crore rupees is what we look at. See, the impact of it, I mean, it's a small, I mean, it's a small waiver if you wish to think of it in terms of the portfolio of the loan. But what it does is it introduces within the repayment scheme politics. I mean, who is waived? You have to go into the detail. Whose schemes have they waived? Whom have they given this waiver to? And what are the benefits? Is it to their own constituency that they've given benefit to? And the problem it does at a larger level, if you think of it as the microfinance revolution that's happened and then it flopped in Andhra Pradesh, is related to something that you have said, where the government just came and announced that, look, these microfinance institutions are here to make money. They're not really solving any of your problem. And the government announced that you don't have to repay the loan. So you look at what has happened to microfinance institution in Andhra Pradesh. It has totally come to a standstill. Now, I must admit, that there's no evidence whatsoever whether microfinance institution have any impact on poverty or not. Even Banerjee Duplo's work is quite ambiguous. In fact, the way I see that work, it is desperately trying to find an impact. I mean, it, 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 it's hard to find an impact, you know, in some sense. Now, that could be because, you know, we need many more studies to understand, you know, what impact. But as far as the industry is concerned, as far as 
if it if it is an option for people, if they are not being forced to take a loan from microfinance, nobody is putting a gun on their head and forcing them to go to microfinance. Today we are seeing that that sector is completely taxed. So that is the impact in some sense. And if you speak to any bankers, you know they are not very eager to lend in rural areas or to aggregate because of the political reasons. They are very worried whether these loans will be repaid or not. So that's. Hello, I'm Vasundra from the Global Development Network. Um, I have a question regarding um, um, just design, experiment design. Uh, in my experience, we have had a few issues with sample sizes. Um, so is it possible, are the new methods of uh, doing impact evaluation, uh, which is statistically significant uh, for small sample sizes? Well, I. I if I'm not an RCT person, maybe Sharon will. But there's something we call the power of a test. You know, the power of the test, in some sense, tries to tell you. I mean, in, in essence, what it's trying to tell you, how big should your sample be, right? So in our study, for example, we have many more treatment than, con uh, sorry, many more control than treatment. Now, there are statistical methods that exist. Of course, you have to make certain assumptions about them. You know how the variables are correlated to each other and stuff like that. Then it gives you a guidance, for example, that your sample size should be minimum 2,000 or 3,000. But those tests do ex exist, and you can use them. Those are standard tools, I think, now, which will tell you whether you have enough sample size or not. Uh, how, I mean, you know, Anand was asking the same question, that the difference that you see between control and treatment, is it really due to statistical reasons, or is it because the sample size is too small? And therefore, we cannot draw any inference from it. You know, the small sample size makes your, even if your estimates are not biased, they can make your standard estimates uh, very biased as well. And therefore, you might not be able to draw any inference. But we have standard power methods that you can use. Yeah? We have time for one last question. Yeah, the key finding you mentioned is uh, the firms which, uh, uh, after the policy reversal, the firms, they were not uh, qualified to get uh, loans were like still uh, getting more credit and uh, and sales were higher. So I was wondering if that's true for kind of 11 million firm, why it's not true for 6.8 million firm? Like after one or two cycles of uh, uh, getting loan, even those firms which are in the margin, like say 6.4 or 7 million, should also uh, kind of uh, kind of established a relationship with the bank should have grown. So if that's true, or your your finding is true, then the whole program that we've been running for the last four, like 40 years should have been a big success, right? Well, it should not be a big success if you restrict production to inefficient firms. Right? I mean, what the, the program is telling you essentially is that, look, as long as you remain of a particular size, subsidies will come to you. So now think of yourself. I mean, you are a producer. You suddenly realize that you have a benefit of subsidy that is free money coming, or you could earn money by expanding production. So at the margin, you would decide not to grow if free money coming in the form of subsidies is greater than what it would take you to put in the effort to expand production. So if you look at the distribution of firms, you're sort of restricting yourself to smaller firms. And we know, we have enough evidence to show that smaller firms are less productive than larger firms. There is enough evidence, even in the Indian data, we analyze the annual survey of industries data, national sample survey. There's enough evidence to show that. So now, what we are saying essentially is true. The firms, will, they will keep getting the loans from the bank. But is that the best way to deal with this situation? Is that the best way to generate employment? And we are arguing, essentially, that might not be the case. Because the rate of growth in the firms that got the subsidies that were larger than these smaller firms was much higher. That's the point. I'm sorry, we don't have time for any more questions, but uh, there will be a tea and coffee session outside, so if anyone wants to interact with the speakers, they can do so then. Uh, I will now hand the mic over to John to give his closing comments. Sharon, thank you very much for, for presenting today. And I hope that the audience got, got something out of this in terms of beginning to think more about impact evaluation and, and how the role of impact evaluation within broader kind of program evaluation or policy evaluation. And I think that the one thing is quite interesting is that in Sharon's presentation, 
this is a, a question that would be hard, it's a difficult question to answer. So what is the impact of, for people to move out of largely kind of people based in the in urban environments to move into a kind of higher quality housing and in the periphery? And through like a, in this case, a lottery, you do have a chance to, to compare. So normally if you just would go out and look at people who, would, who were chosen to live in, in these areas, uh, there could be a whole lots of reasons, like Sharon suggested, that uh, that there is any differences in health or in economic status, or in their uh, how they support each other after a natural disaster, may not be due to to actually their location, but would be due to other factors that that made them live, give them the opportunity to live out there in the first place. So that that kind of ability to have a, a counterfactual through through a lottery system. Is something that we wanted to to have Sharon kind of to highlight, um, and I think one key point to that is that sometimes the results are surprising. So I would have thought that in this case that you would have definitely seen uh, improvements in health for some of the reasons that were stated, you know, for for piped water and, and for maybe a, a less dense population density, and that's not something that that you do see. Um, so I think that that that's one of the the neat things about impact evaluation is that. Sometimes they come up with surprising results, and those results are kind of based in in, uh, in strong evidence because you're kind of comparing like to like um, with groups. And and for Mudit, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I think the the key point is that in any evaluation, whether it be program evaluation, that you don't have the method kind of driving the question. And so uh, I think that that's a good example of this is a really interesting question. Uh, what would be the role of subsidized credit on increasing exports? And as he points out, you can never use a, a randomized evaluation technique for that. Um, and my point in earlier on was just say that there are certain assumptions that you have to make when you're, when you're using this type of difference and difference technique. But sometimes those assumptions can be completely valid. So it's not to say that, that this is like a, a type of approach that's kind of substandard to doing a randomized evaluation. And in this case, you know, looking at, at the what I really liked is that in the control group, you had both big firms that were kind of all that would always uh, that would never qualify for the subsidy, um, and then you have also kind of smaller groups that would that would always qualify for the subsidy, and so the kind of like that differences in terms of trends that you might expect to to see between treatment and control, and that way are, are, are type kind of negated. So I thought that that was that was quite interesting. Um, and again, you also get, you know, through this type of rigorous evaluation, you also get a surprising result. And in this case, the surprising result is, I mean, I think at the beginning, there's good, very good reasons to argue uh, why providing greater subsidized credit would, would lead to an expansion for these firms. But you, it's not necessarily, like, intuitive that if you did, if you kind of, st that policy stopped, that these firms would be able to continue to borrow and to continue to expand. And so I think that's another really neat part of doing this kind of empirical research is that, again, these are surprising results you can get um, from the studies. So thank you very much both for, for presenting with us today. I think we'll, we'll probably continue a, the roundtable series again in, in January. We'll probably do a couple others on, on methods. So I think we might stick to uh, a couple of other quasi-experimental methods. And then I also want to bring in uh, some other qualitative methods that maybe that we're not using as much at JPAL, but some of the other evaluators in our community are, and, and, and you'll have those be presented as well. Um, I'm also, just to, to end up, I want to uh, introduce one of our very close partners at CLEAR. We're, so CLEAR's been around for, for one year in India, um, in South Asia, and we're just kind of working on our, our, our work plan over the next couple of years. And because we're a very modestly sized center, uh, the impact that we and that we have is, is a lot of it is through having very good partnerships. So we have a very close partnership, obviously, with IFMR. We would like to, to work increasingly more with, with ISB as well. And there's a group, uh, a community of evaluators that's been very active in, in India and in South Asia who we're very much looking forward to working even closer with. Uh, so in, in Shrub will probably say a little bit more about this. At the end of February, there's an evaluation conclave in Nepal, and there's a great uh, group of workshops and, and lectures that is going to be in, in, in Kathmandu. A lot of it focused on regional m and &E specialists, but also having some of the bigger names in the m and &E community uh, from abroad will also be there. 
Um, and Diva Dar, who's our policy and training manager at, at CLEAR and at the JPAL South Asia, uh, and Sri just got back from, from Bangladesh where they're kind of exploring with the community evaluators how we can work even more closely in the next couple of uh, years. So Shub, maybe I can turn it over to you and, and give you uh, a, a chance to make everyone familiar with your work and, and different opportunities to collaborate. It's the time is tight now, just so take a couple of yeah, five, yeah. five minutes or so. Just a couple of minutes, really. Yeah. You know, you, you, gave us, you, know, you gave a great introduction, John. I really appreciate uh, that. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, information on the conclave, uh, you know, folders. Please, you know, pick up this, you know, on your way out. And as John said, uh, you know, this is our second conclave. And uh, we had tremendous response the first time in 2010. We had uh, over 350 participants from South Asia. And the focus really of our work is to, you know, to promote uh, uh, evaluation, the field of evaluation, and support practitioners in South Asia. Uh, so uh, please do uh, come and join us at the conclave. Uh, uh, take this information with you and uh, ask your, uh, organizer, your organization to support you, to sponsor you. Uh, and I just would like to say um, a few words about the community of evaluators. Uh, we've been around for uh, three years, and it's just been a small group so far, uh, you know, about 30 uh, professionals from South Asia, sort of uh, building the, uh, the institution. Uh, we've, uh, you know, to sort of institutionalize a membership-based platform to support uh, uh, practitioners, those who are interested in commissioning evaluations, because uh, Everybody is interested in evaluation, but we're all working, you know, sort of in, in sort of small islands, and we don't have an opportunity to, uh, to uh, exchange information, share what you are doing, and kind of connect with people who are doing similar things and have similar interests. So this is uh, the purpose of really providing this platform to connect uh, and engage with each other in South Asia. Uh, we have, we're glad to announce, we're just opening up uh, membership, uh, a broader membership uh, for the first time, and uh, we're offering it for uh, only ten dollars. So please, you know, please sign up. And some of the benefits uh, you get from the membership, you know, is uh, visibility for your own work. We have a monthly newsletter uh, that you can, uh, you know, uh, talk about, you know, your work and announce, you know, events and so on. You have an opportunity to connect with other members. Uh, have your CVs and competencies on our website, uh, start blogs uh, and post research, uh, et cetera, uh, and join in capacity building activities. So a lot of information that you will have access to, you know, as well as you know, promoting your own work and organization and, uh, you know, and, and so on. So uh, I'd love to, love to have you be part of our, our community. <laughs> Uh, we have these uh, brochures. Please, you know, please feel free to take them. Uh, and if you would like more information on the COE, the Community uh, of Evaluators for South Asia, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, sign, you know, put, you know, give us your name, and we'll, we'll contact you. Thank you.